I was very skeptical and even critical of Death Stranding going into it. I bashed it for pretentious marketing, intentionally vague explanations of gameplay, and I heavily criticized Kojima himself for his seeming inability to concisely or even coherently define what Death Stranding was. It seemed to be a game sold entirely on the name of its creator, which is actually antithetical to Kojima's own beliefs, or at least the beliefs that he described in 2014 with PT. You see, when he released the playable teaser onto the PlayStation Store as a free demo, he intentionally hid his name, his studio, and his publisher's branding from every piece of the demo's promotional materials. And according to him, he did this so that players would be free of any presuppositions they may have going into a title knowing who created it. In other words, he wanted players to enjoy PT for what it was, not for who it was created by. However, this is not so for Death Stranding. Death Stranding was sold entirely on Kojima's name and the brilliance with which he crafts his games. This is an important and remarkable shift in the pure sense of the word, and it's one that cannot be overlooked. This frankly changes the way that we all will look and play the game because Kojima himself is changing the way that he presents it to us. Now, of course it goes without saying, but when any individual is tied so inextricably to a game, you have to look at it through that lens. And so I decided to play Death Stranding as an impartial observer or even as a critic. I am by no means a fanboy of Kojima, and I have never actually played to completion any of his other games. Although I did play roughly five hours of Metal Gear Solid 5 in preparation for this video. Now if you followed this channel, you'll know that I was not a fan of Death Stranding when I began. In fact, it took roughly eight hours for it to click and for me to begin enjoying it even in the least. I even made a video where I roasted the first two hours of the game, much to the chagrin of the game's fans. However, after this eight hour mark, in other words, once I got to the mid game, I started looking forward to playing the game when I got back from classes, and it actually became my relaxation outlet. Hiking and delivering packages was effectively stress relief. Simply put, Death Stranding for me is a junk food game. It's easy to consume, nearly impossible to fathom, and it leaves you feeling as though you must consume more to gain any sustenance whatsoever, even though there isn't actually much there. Now, no game is perfect, Death Stranding included, and while introducing some interesting ideas to the industry, it does have some serious flaws. Now, I'm going to be very honest in this video. I'm a fan of the game, and I think most people who are critical of it have reasonable points, but there are also things that Death Stranding does well, and we'll discuss all of these things in this video. But the point is, if we're not honest about the game's shortcomings, we can't help Kojima with whatever his next game is, and if you've played Death Stranding for any length of time, you should be aware of some of the plethora of issues. And I just want to reiterate that while I am very conflicted on many of the design choices made here, and I am going to spend most of this video explaining all of the problems with the game, I really did enjoy my time with Death Stranding on the whole. If I had to describe the game concisely, I would say that it's a repetitive, relaxing, and uncomplicated game that is overly reliant on ambiguous storytelling and falls victim to some very bizarre directorial decisions at the hands of Hideo Kojima, a man so closely tied to Death Stranding that he and the game are inextricably tied, mostly due to his own statements saying as much. It's also probably important that I mention my qualifications for making this video. I've put in well over 100 hours into Death Stranding on two separate PS4s, a Slim and a Pro, to get an idea of what this game can do technically, something we'll touch on lightly later. I read all of the emails, completed all of the premium deliveries, fought all of the BTs, drove all of the vehicles, talked to every celebrity, shook all the babies, hunted down the memory chips, five-starred the locations, explored the whole map, and after all of that, I can say confidently that Death Stranding is by far the most ironic game that I have ever played in my life. 
You see, the game was advertised as a new genre of game, something that would focus on positivity and connecting people from all over the world. But instead, it's become one of the most divisive games of the last decade, maybe of all time. Some will say that the world is empty, boring, and the gameplay is repetitive and the writing is terrible, while others will say that Death Stranding is a triumph, a game that tries something new and succeeds, a game focused on connections and fulfillment. And the amazing thing is that everyone here is kind of right. And I know that sounds like an oxymoron or completely nonsensical, but I think I can actually defend that statement throughout the course of this video. But this is my primary point. The Death Stranding was advertised and held up as a game that would bring people together. And I can't help but find it extremely ironic that it has done the exact opposite. Now, as we move forward into the video, I ask that you please hear me out on all of the critiques I have for the game. Furthermore, I'd also like for you to contribute all of your critiques and contributions down in the comment section below. I will be reading through all of them. Now, if you'd like my concise recommendation, I'd say that you should only play Death Stranding if you have already been intrigued by it, which if you are, chances are you've already played it. The unfortunate reality is that if you are skeptical of Death Stranding to any degree, or if there are things that have repelled you thus far, the game isn't going to convince you otherwise. And the bizarre thing is that it seems as though this was a conscious design choice on the part of Kojima Productions. That, or it's just blatant stupidity, something that we're going to discuss in just a moment. However, if there is any chance that you're going to play this game, you should do that first before watching. Don't worry, this video will still be here once you're done. Also, a couple of things that you should know, I did conduct a massive survey with over 2,400 respondents. Thank you, by the way, for all of you who contributed, and I will be mentioning it throughout the video. I have posted all of the data collected from this survey on my website, lukestevens.net, so that you can sift through it and hold me accountable. If you want to participate in the next survey for the next critique, make sure to follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Discord so that you can be notified of when I publish it. I also have a section in this video where I go over some descriptive analytics that I performed on data that I collected while playing. This is dense and kind of complicated stuff, I get that, so rest assured that I'm going to try and make it as accessible as possible. And lastly, I want to thank all of these patrons for funding the creation of this video. Straight up, it wouldn't have been made if these people didn't step up and contribute over on Patreon. Thank you to all of you. And a special vocal shout out to Zachary Johnson, Mike Holland, Christopher Scott, and Paige Richardson for their extreme generosity. I understand that this is a long video, so I have timestamps below so you can jump around to chapters that you find most appealing. And of course, it should go without saying, but this video is going to spoil pretty much everything, so consider this your spoiler warning. But with all of that said, let's get into it. The first impressions that a game gives the player are extremely important. They're important for a variety of reasons, but chief among them is that they serve to convince players who are skeptical of the game's quality that they should continue playing. Now normally for a $60 release, if somebody has gone through the trouble of paying that amount of money for the game, chances are they're already fairly confident that they're going to enjoy the game. So what's the point of having an extremely polished first two hours or so if players are already forking over the cash? Well, for one, I would hope that the artist creating the game would want players to be intrigued by the title that they've put forward. But furthermore, Death Stranding is such a polarizing game and the gameplay was such a matter of debate before its release that many people watched streams and clips of the introductory hours of gameplay to decide whether or not they were going to try it. This is pretty freaking gorgeous. I mean, for real, look at this. Norman Reedus, the real-time rendering of pubes on a man's face has never looked so good. And the unfortunate reality for Kojima Productions is that many people started playing the game and decided to quit within the first few hours. This is a selection of responses from the survey I mentioned earlier of players who quit playing the game after starting it. Among the chief reasons why people stopped playing were that they said the first few hours were uninteresting, slow, 
boring, confusing, and even not as advertised. Now it's fair that every game is going to have some players who drop off after starting it. That's completely unavoidable, even for a masterpiece. But the key takeaway is that going into the game, the major contention on everybody's minds were whether or not this game was going to be uninteresting, slow, boring, or confusing. And the first few hours of the game certainly didn't help these preconceived notions. But what specifically did Kojima do? Well, he started the story in a very strategic way, where Sam is just another porter performing normal deliveries like everybody else, and it's implied that there's essentially an army of these types of porters that are delivering packages across the continental United States. Now, I'll be honest, I like this more than the alternative, like in the old school God of War games, like God of War 3, where you have all of the abilities up front and then they're ripped from you after you've tasted the forbidden fruit of what the player could look forward to having later in the game. But it doesn't change the fact that this starts very slow. In the opening cutscene, Sam loses his bike, and you're forced to transport cargo on foot for the first few hours. Furthermore, it goes on for a while. The first two hours really do feel like a trudge, and I don't think that this is a controversial thing to say, even if you are a fan of the game. Again, I enjoyed my time with Death Stranding, but this is simply a reality. The first few hours, the pacing is all over the place. There also aren't very many interesting gameplay mechanics introduced here. In fact, the only missions that you're sent on are to deliver a small package of drugs to a dying president, assist a corpse disposal crew, you watch some cutscenes, and then you are asked to incinerate the president's body after she's croaked. And I don't really have an issue with these types of deliveries. In fact, I actually find them fairly relaxing and satisfying, as I mentioned earlier. But it does reaffirm the stereotype that Death Stranding is just a walking simulator, especially because there's no real dynamic encounters. There's no animals that you'll encounter in the world when you're going on these trips. It's just you walking with some type of cargo strapped to your back, trying to keep balance as you walk across a large open field scattered with rocks that are just there to make it slightly tedious for you to walk from point A to point B. Again, not inherently bad. It just reaffirms the preconceived notion that Death Stranding only has walking to offer in terms of gameplay, even though, as we'll find out later in the game, there's much more to it. Now, the baseline gameplay loop is made up, of course, of transporting cargo from one location to another, or going to one location receiving cargo and returning it. In other words, a fetch quest. Now, some people have heavily criticized the game for the core gameplay loop being made up of this very simple task, which I actually disagree with. Any activity can be be turned into a game, given enough attention and time, whether it's farming, hunting, or even talking, all of these things can be turned into an experience that's worth playing. Furthermore, Death Stranding's gameplay system grows more complex over the course of the game. They add guns, grenade launchers, monster boss fights that are dynamic, BT zones, and even humanoid enemies known as mules that track your every movement and can hunt you down. However, you will need to get past around the 10 hour mark to see most of these things in full capacity. And some of these things, such as grenade launchers, aren't even introduced until 25 to 30 hours in. And this is one of the necessary frustrations with Death Stranding, and it's a result of the studio that made it. Like many Japanese titles, your time is required to buy into the world and the gameplay. And I actually have a few examples. Monster Hunter World, for instance, is a Japanese action RPG that I love to death, and it requires a steep learning curve and a lot of effort on the player's part if you want to learn what all of the different components are that contribute to a fully min-maxed build. I've put in roughly 100 hours into Monster Hunter World, and I'm still learning new things that the game has to offer. Or look at Persona 5's introductory section that can last by itself 15 to 22 hours, depending on your playstyle and pace. And yes, that's considered the introduction. The point is, Japanese game development is different than westernized game development. Their games tend to have a lot of meat to them and they require a lot of time on the player's part in order to buy into and understand everything that there is to offer. And this actually causes a lot of western players to be turned off by these types of games. Like it or not, western gamers are very impatient and if a game is not grabbing a player within the first hour or even maybe two hours 
numbers, they're just going to walk away. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's just a feature of our culture, I suppose. But the point is, Kojima even knew this, which is why he roasted Americans for not having the quote-unquote artistic sensibilities on the level required to appreciate games such as Death Stranding to their fullest extent. And here's confession time. I live in the United States, in Colorado. I'm a Western gamer through and through, and I am used to most of the coolest stuff in a game being front-loaded to make sure that my attention is captured, to show me what they have to offer. Look at Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. The first two hours are polished to high heaven, and they are great. Or The Witcher 3, where the Griffin fight is front-loaded as with some butts, which naturally sold me on it. Or Grand Theft Auto V, where the robbery sequence is front-loaded to show you what you can look forward to later in the game. The point is, a majority of AAA Western titles, specifically the ones that are critically acclaimed, often feature front-loaded gameplay sequences. Like it or not, it's sort of a standard of Western titles at this point. And the strange thing is that Death Stranding kind of meets this halfway. What I mean is that the gameplay system is not very robust or extremely dense and complicated, requiring hours upon hours of intensive research and studying to understand it. Rather, it's pretty simple and just requires the player to mindlessly deliver packages from point A to point B. What does require a huge amount of investment on the part of the player is the narrative. For instance, the best moment in this introductory section is the void out that we get to witness up close. It's bizarre and fantastic. Really, there are a lot of interesting things here and we're gonna go over them in detail in just a few minutes. Now, I don't know about you, but when I saw this first, I was concerned that they weren't actually going to have answers for most of the things that they were showing, but they actually do. And it looks like Kojima thought most of this through, at least in as bizarre a way as you would expect from Kojima. You just have to wait roughly 38 hours to get those answers. Other problems also arise due to the fact that the game was developed narratively and written in Japanese, and then it was ported, <laughs> get it, over to English. This is actually incredibly important to understand, and I think it's a reason why a lot of the writing in Death Stranding has been panned. This is a Japanese written story. Thus, the dialogue is translated from the original writings of Kojima and his team into English for the actors, and this can, at times, lead to some really strange and clunky phrasings. But don't worry, we'll get to this more later. Now, you could argue that Death Stranding front loads some of its more flashy cinematic sequences, and I think that that's fair to say, especially with that void out sequence that we just looked at. But in my opinion, front loading gameplay would have been a better idea, due to gamers' preconceived notions that the game is slow and has uninteresting gameplay. I don't know, that's just my opinion though. Let me know your thoughts below. Beyond this, even with elaborate cutscenes shown off that are very flashy, interesting, and even visually intriguing, shall we say, these first two hours of Death Stranding are very bland and even downright confusing, which I think is actually okay because it is a prologue after all. And I think if a prologue wasn't at least somewhat confusing and intriguing, it probably wouldn't be doing its job. But from here, the story progresses, mostly through cutscenes featuring the main cast. People like Sam, Fragile, Amelie, Mama, Deadman, Die Hardman, Hartman, Higgs, Cliff, and some others. Some of these scenes are actually really well acted. I mean, there's a reason that Mads Mikkelsen won the Game Award for Best Performance, but some other scenes are, well, not. For instance, Lea Sado's scenes are universally awesome, in spite of the writing. Not because of, I think that's important to understand. I'm Fragile. But I'm not that fresh, you. In fact, her scenes are even up there with Mads Mikkelsen's, which I think is high praise. She has a very dry and yet emotional way of delivering her dialogue, and while it does seem stilted at times, I think that's mostly a result of the dialogue she's being fed. There's no question that most of these actors are highly qualified to be in this piece. Whether you're looking at Mads, Leia, or Norman, all of these guys are qualified and are very talented performers. So perhaps I'm being unreasonable, but to me it seems fair to blame most of the stilted lines and delivery on the direction and the writing as opposed to the performances. However, some of the performances that we see are downright bizarre and laughably bad. In my opinion, one of the worst performances we see in the game is that of Bridget slash Amelie. 
These scenes are bizarre, they're staged strangely, they're written in extremely verbose ways, and they're presented in a manner that makes it seem like it should be very profound, yet it appears to the viewer almost comedic. In fact, at the end of the game, Amelie rambles for roughly 40 minutes, slathering the player in unprompted exposition. And when I was playing this for the first time, I was actually in my bedroom and my fiance Nikki was sitting on the bed watching me play. And well, this was her reaction to Amelie finally finishing one of her 10 minute monologue diatribes. 10 minutes ago. <laughs> and a lot of things actually follow this trend in Death Stranding. Inexplicably bad pacing, dialogue, and hilariously weird directorial choices. Now some people will say that this is just Kojima's style. They say this to defend the game's more eccentric design choices, and this is one of the weirder things to me. People are defending something that doesn't hold any weight themselves. What I mean is that of all of the things to concede as weird design choices, it would be something like a planted ad while a character in the game goes poop. That seems like something we could all agree is a weird thing to include. But the hardcore Kojima fans will defend this as part of his style, and if you don't like it, you simply don't get it. Now I don't need to explain ad nauseum the fact that this is an appeal to authority fallacy, it's completely incomprehensible, and in fact, it's the height of stupidity. Chances are, if you've made it this far into this video, you're not the type of person that's going to be defending a choice like this with the defense that if you don't like it, you just don't get it. I can't reiterate this enough. Just because it's his style doesn't mean that something is good. For instance, I can have a style that's very unique, like filming everything without cuts or having an extreme color grade placed on all of my footage. This may be my style, but that doesn't always mean that it's the best option in a given situation. This is why most great directors have a style, but they remain flexible, either in the application of their style or in the content to which they apply their style. What doesn't kill you make you stranger. <laughs> to mindlessly apply some sort of gimmick on everything that you do, claiming that it's your style, doesn't seem like an artistic expression to me. It seems like a crutch. But this is just one example of this sort of sycophantic fanboyism that you see that surrounds Kojima. It's really bizarre, and I don't know if it's just an army of accounts that Jeff Keighley has created, or if there are actual people out there that defend everything Kojima does as holy and infallible. Mr. Hideo Kojima. But regardless, it is the height of irrationality. Even now, I'm sure if you look in the comment section of this video, you're going to see people defending things that Kojima did in this game and problems with Death Stranding, saying that if you don't like it, you just don't get it. Now, if you don't know what Stockholm Syndrome is, it's basically when somebody develops feelings of admiration or respect for someone with whom they should have negative feelings. So, I'm going to call what we're seeing with these sycophantic Kojima fans, Kojima Syndrome. Maybe somebody else has come up with a name for this that's more fitting, but I'm calling it Kojima Syndrome because it's like Stockholm Syndrome and I find it kind of funny. Let's try applying this to several examples. There are little to no animals in the game, even though we see a plethora of them in the introductory cutscene of the title. Is this a lazy shortcoming due to technical restraints or budgetary restrictions? Or is it a meta discussion of the emptiness of nature without conscious life and mankind's role within nature on a larger scale? Who can say? 
Kojima syndrome, or the fact that all of the boss fights are extremely clunky and don't actually put the player in much physical danger with the extremely generous reload system that they've put in place with the repatriation. Again, is this just bad gameplay design, a shortcoming of the development team, or is it a statement on the helplessness of man in the face of death? Kojima syndrome. Or lastly, the fact that you mostly interact with humans through holograms, copy and pasted throughout the world whenever you deliver products back and forth. Is this simply lazy copy and pasted content to speed up development and get a game out quickly? Or is it a commentary on how reliant we are on technology that brings us all together? Again, Kojima syndrome. If you're not convinced of this, that's fine. Just keep an open mind moving forward through the next few sections. But I do have many more examples of when Kojima syndrome rears its ugly head. But having said all of that, I want you to know that I do have some fond feelings for Death Stranding. I found my time relaxing, even rejuvenating, but there are objectively bad elements that Death Stranding has that deserve to be called out. Kojima isn't immune to criticism just because Konami screwed him over. And despite largely enjoying my time with the game, I do have an obligation to call these things out and to critique the game fairly. So while it may seem that I'm only criticizing the game, remember that for one, this is a critique and that's, well, kind of the point. And two, I enjoy Death Stranding writ large. And I'll be elaborating more on those parts later. Overall, the game is interesting, and it lays out some original ideas, but initial impressions don't do much to help it. But I don't ever settle for the surface level, and if you've watched this channel, you'll be well aware of that. So, let's go through the whole game. I know this may seem like overkill and excessively detailed, but if any game ever deserved such a deep dive, it would be this the most polarizing game of this generation. So the game consists of 15 main story-driven chapters, each of which contain a plethora of orders that you need to complete. They are as follows. The prologue, Porter, and then episodes Bridget, Amelie, Fragile, which is by far the longest chapter in terms of content and orders to be completed, Unger, Mama, Deadman, Clifford, Hartman, Higgs, Die Hardman, Clifford Unger, Bridges, Sam Strand, Lou, and the last chapter, Tomorrow is in Your Hands, which is sort of a chapter, but also not. We'll talk about this more in a minute. Now, most people, including the official Death Stranding Wiki moderators, tend to separate all of these episodes into one of three acts. Act one is the prologue through episode four. Act two is episodes five through 10, and act three is episodes 11 through 14, with episode 15 being the perpetual endgame state of the game, which again, we're gonna address later. Now each act has its own focus. Act one is focused on introducing the gameplay systems and the story. And in my opinion, this is the shortest and worst of all the three acts. This is often what people are talking about when they say most players have to get over the hump. Act two is gameplay focused and it introduces a ton of new areas, both visually and in terms of gameplay. It features upgraded equipment and really lets the line out for the player. This section is the most dynamic because the player can add in as many of these standard ordered quests as they want, or they can engage with the dynamic quests, which are centered around finding other players' abandoned packages and delivering them to their original destinations. These can be as numerous or as scarce as the player wants. It's a nice way of reminding the player that there are other people that exist in the world, even if you don't see them, which is what we're going to talk about later. But to be honest, I really like this, the idea that if I drop a package, it's not a total loss, and that somebody else may come along, pick it up, and deliver it for me. They'll get likes out of it, which is the social currency that features in Death Stranding, and I will also get some likes because my package has been delivered. It's the basic you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours mechanic that you see in many, many games. But in this case, it's used to make the player feel as though they're connected with players from around the world who they will never see, speak to, or interact with in any way other than these indirect interactions through signs, pieces of equipment that you craft, such as generators, zip lines, post boxes, and the like. And of course, also these packages that you pick up dynamically throughout the world. Now, in terms of specific placement of all of these things, it seems pretty random, and I actually did a lot of math to back this up, which again, we'll talk about later. I know I'm saying that for everything, but I promise we'll get to it. Act three is narratively focused, with lots of smaller sections pieced together. 
It has many varied chapters in all different locations that span from World War I to World War II to Vietnam all the way to a snowy mountainside. These really are the narrative reward for the players who have made it this far, this far being roughly 20 to 25 hours. There are a ton of very long cutscenes that span anywhere from 5 minutes to 15 to 40 minutes long, so make sure you've got your popcorn popped before you head into the last few chapters. But I do want to say there are some fantastic performances, as I said earlier, I'm looking at you, Mads. Now, through all of these chapters, you're exploring the map. Death Stranding was, of course, made with the Decima engine, which is the same engine that was used for Horizon Zero Dawn, which itself featured a plethora of highly varied biomes and made the world feel as though it spanned a much larger area than it actually did. And I might be picky, but it seems as though this world really isn't as varied as it was initially made out to be. Even though it's meant to span effectively the entire United States, it really doesn't feel extremely large. In fact, at the very end of the game, one of your final assignments is to cross back over every square inch of the map that you've traveled to get back to the East Coast on foot. I like the meta implications of this assignment because it makes you go back and see how far you've come, but when I was doing this, I realized it only took me 20 to 30 minutes to travel all that way. And again, maybe I'm being picky, but it seems as though for a map that's supposed to represent the entire United States, it really isn't very big. But I digress. We'll discuss that more later in the gameplay section when we address the world's layout and construction. But for now, let's discuss the opening of the game. As I stated earlier, the opening of Death Stranding isn't very effective, but this does beg the question, what would be effective? Now by effective, I mean what do the opening hours have to achieve in order to convince players, skeptical and not, that it's actually worth playing past these opening hours. Now in my estimation, it seems that for each game this is going to be different depending on the context. What I mean is that the opening hours of Fallout 4 or Cyberpunk 2077 are going to be different depending on how they were pitched, the public's perception of the company that's publishing and creating the game, and it can even be influenced by something as generic as the price tag. For a $60 game, for instance, one would expect an extremely expansive, polished, experience. Whereas if Kojima were to only charge $40 for Death Stranding, people would go into it with a lesser expectation. This is why Naughty Dog, when they released The Lost Legacy, which was actually a standalone Uncharted game, even though most people haven't heard of it, they were able to get away with an experience that's only six hours long and is very, very narrow compared to that of Uncharted 4, all because they only charged $40 for the game out of the gate. They set the expectation, and then the game was able to live up to that expectation. With Death Stranding, there are a lot of preconceived notions that players have and had going into it. To me, it seems as though Death Stranding should have tried to convince a lot of skeptical people that the game isn't that which its critics claim it to be. Of course, fans of Kojima's work were going to be interested regardless. They were going to play it all the way through, no matter what. And this is reflected in the poll that I took of players of Death Stranding. But new players have to be convinced of its worth. And I don't even think this is a controversial thing to say, but I'm sure there will be some disagreeing in the comments. But at least hear me out. Specifically what I mean is that Death Stranding has to prove that for one, it has a rewarding and worthwhile gameplay loop, and for two, the narrative makes sense and has been thought through. Specifically number one, because this was referred to as a walking simulator by many before launch, which I actually disagree with, but again, I'll discuss that later. I know I've said that a thousand times, but I will. The point is, for new players coming in, such as myself, having had no major experience to Kojima other than with PT and smaller projects, they are going to have this in mind from the very beginning. They're going to be approaching Death Stranding with the preconceived idea that it is a walking simulator with gameplay that's unsatisfying and boring. All Kojima would have to do is create the opening hours of Death Stranding in such a way that players would be convinced that there was more to this gameplay system than initially seemed present. Kojima could have done this in a plethora of ways. For one, he could have started the game with a massive BT battle, not just a cutscene of it, but an actual gameplay system showing how you can fight these things as you do later on. 
Or he could have kept the large cutscene that shows off these BTs in the first couple hours and just added some interactive parts to it. Quick time events in effect. Same thing that Naughty Dog does with all of their games. Again, nobody was skeptical of the fact that Kojima had a really beautiful and bizarre world to play with in Death Stranding. What they doubted was the gameplay that backed that story up. Now, some of you may think that all of these things shouldn't be very important, but this is what is either going to hook players into a 50-hour playthrough or repel players after a single hour of playing. And before the pedantic comment comes along where somebody says that an hour isn't enough time to determine if a game is good or not, I respectfully disagree. It should be enough. An hour is a long time after all, though often the pacing of a game can be so awful that the first hour is terrible, yet the later sections are great. But I will admit that this is a personal preference. Some people are willing to grind through dozens upon dozens of hours of content before they get to the meat of the game, while I personally think that that's unacceptable. Regardless, this all should be easy enough to do right? Kojima should be able to create an opening sequence that pulls people in. He just would have had to show players some flashy gameplay and hook them with an intriguing narrative mechanism. But no, Kojima completely fails at this, and I think I can convince you. To do this, I want to go through the opening sequence of the game, and I'm actually going to keep these two things that Death Stranding has to prove up on screen. That way, as we go through this, you can consistently ask yourself whether or not these checks are being met. Because like it or not, this is the mental check that players are going to be applying as they go through the opening sequence, consciously or not. Death Stranding opens with what is presented as a profound quote from Kobo Abe's poem, Nawa. I, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that name right. I'm going to be perfect. Kobo Abe's? Kobo Abe? I, I have no idea. Regardless, it's not that relevant at the moment, and even when it is explained and tied back into the narrative, it fails to feel completely and truly profound, specifically when Deadman quotes it at the very end of the game. The president must have known all of this would happen. Ironic, isn't it? The gun that set this whole mess in motion ends up being the key to saving you. Hmm. I'm away. She said it had another purpose. Not a weapon, but a lifeline. A stick that became a rope. <laughs> I suppose that's one way of putting it. After the excerpt is shown and plays off, the credits roll in with a ton of beautiful landscape shots. And I don't know about you, but initially I thought these were all in-engine or in-game screenshots or clips to show us the lands that we were going to be exploring as we went through the game. And I got really excited. However, upon further investigation, it actually turns out, according to most people on the forums I've read through, the consensus seems to be that these are actually the reference photos that Kojima Productions took when they did a company trip to Iceland to get reference photos for the landscapes within the game. They put in some references to the later games, such as the Corellium Hands and things, but there really isn't much here. It's just photos of landscapes. Regardless, it's pretty and it shows you what they're trying to mimic, and the fact that it looks as though it could be in engine says everything. It's really impressive that the engine is able to push things that could look this good, even if in effect and in practice when you're playing through the game, they don't hold up to this standard. After these shots, the game opens up with Sam Porter riding a motorcycle across a lush green rocky mountainside. It's really pretty, and it shows just what kind of cinematic experience you're in for. It's raining, and this rain, you'll come to find out, is known as Timefall, which makes everything it touches age at an extremely fast rate. This has a ton of implications on gameplay in addition to the story, but again, we'll get to that later. As he's writing, you see the Timefall take effect on his hair, the grass, the plants, and of course the animals that you see running across the mountainside. Even though you're not going to see hardly any of these things later on, it's still really really cool, and it shows you just what this rain can do. Sam speeds off, and then all of a sudden... Yeah, you seemingly run into her. 
Turns out she can teleport away to a beach, which is this game world's effective purgatory. Basically, when somebody dies, they go to their own beach, and this is the intermediate place between this life and the afterlife. Some people in this world can actually interact freely with their beaches and use it to teleport around or to even, at times, come back from the dead, which is what is referred to in the game as repatriates, Sam being one of them, which is how the game explains how you can die in gameplay and come back to life. Regardless, the bike goes over the side of a cliff and is destroyed. However, if you know anything about video games, you'll realize that you will eventually get access to one of these soon enough, because why the hell not? The developers spent all this time making the bike. Surely they would not just have done that for a cutscene. Realizing that you now have to travel on foot, you collect the packages that fell off and you start walking. You eventually stumble into a cave and you talk with Fragile a bit. Here it's explained that Sam cries whenever he's exposed to something called Carillium, and Fragile has the same allergic reaction. We also see our first BT, or beached thing. Yeah, Kojima loves his abbreviations, as you'll see. Now these don't make a lot of sense to new players. Hell, maybe they don't even make sense to late game players, but mostly they don't try to explain these things at all in the opening sections of the game. They leave it all up to the imagination of the player and ask them just to take it on blind faith that this makes sense. One would think that if a story features monsters who are invisible and apparently have hands as feet and can sense life forces and pass time with their touch, that they would have some sort of massive or mind-blowing explanation of how these things came into existence, what they are, their role in the world, and how the people that inhabit the world interact with them. Now, I'm not saying that Kojima Productions has to explain all of these things immediately. In fact, I think that would make a pretty terrible story if everything was exposited all at once. But it does make Death Stranding appear as though it is suffering from a severe case of lost-itis. Namely, that they were doing and establishing really weird things in the world just because it looked cool and was crazy and eye-catching. This is actually something that the developers over at Guerrilla Games, the creators of Horizon Zero Dawn, hazard against vehemently. In fact, if you watch the documentary explaining how they created Horizon Zero Dawn, you'll hear them discuss what they call the rule of cool. This is basically the idea that you should never put something in the game just because it's cool. And this is also true of the story. If you start falling victim and prey to the rule of cool, all of a sudden the game is going to be nothing but dinosaurs that shoot lasers and have flamethrowers and everybody is half naked. It's going to get out of hand really quickly. Furthermore, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble trying to write your way out of this hole. The TV show Lost ended up in this exact position, when they had a lot of really cool crazy things they were showing off, even though they had no idea how they were going to explain it later on. Now some people will just accept this writ large, they'll accept that it makes sense within the world, and they'll experience the game the way that the writer wants them to. However, the reality is that a lot of players are extremely skeptical of Kojima and his writing ability. So love it or hate it, this doesn't do much of anything to convince players who are skeptical of Kojima and the world that he's established here that he's actually thought everything through and that this makes sense. And I suffered from this fear as well. As I played through these opening hours, the fear was real that they hadn't actually backed up any of this stuff. I mean, seriously, how are they possibly going to explain a bunch of babies that are carried around in tanks on people's bellies or monsters that swim in tar that somehow disappears instantly after some arbitrary distance has been achieved. But I am happy to report, thankfully, Kojima did think all of this stuff through, and he does have some answers as to why these things work the way they do, even if they are vague and kind of insane. However, as to whether or not those answers are good is another question entirely. And this is a slight tangent, but we need to discuss this at some point, so why not now? With a world as strange as Death Strandings, players rightly have a certain expectation. Namely, that the world is thought out and consistent. No one cares if a world is unrealistic or crazy that's never held back sci-fi or fantasy stories before. Rather, we just ask that the world live according to the rules that are supposed to govern it. 
For instance, if you were watching Star Wars and the evil Sith Lord is chilling out on a spaceship with a bunch of aliens while sensing other people's energy using a magical power called the Force and traveling at light speed through an imaginary galaxy, you wouldn't care because the laws of the universe that that story takes place within allow that. But if the Sith Lord all of a sudden was able to freeze time itself by beatboxing and rubbing his nipples, you would immediately be turned off. Well, maybe not in, in that way, but never mind. Point is, you have to be consistent. I'm fine with Death Stranding having magical interdimensional whales, rain that causes time to pass at crazy fast rates, and even Norman Reedus. But all I ask is that it's thought out and justified. Anyways, moving on. Once you're done talking with Fragile, you grab up your stuff and deliver it to the city. You walk through a beautiful valley as music plays and you enter it. This music is really peaceful, the scenery is beautiful, but again, you're just walking with a package on your back. Does this achieve either of the two things outlined earlier? I don't think so. As you walk into the complex, you realize that the compound is actually remarkably bland and it looks dead. There's no one here. In fact, pretty much everyone we're going to be talking to in any of these places throughout the entire 50 hour campaign, they're all gonna be holograms. We're not even going to meet them in person for reasons. Again, Kojima syndrome. You assist a body disposal crew and take a dead body out of the city to have it incinerated. You don't know exactly what the big deal is, but they seem to be taking it very, very seriously, so you play along. There really isn't any player control here. You, at one point, can control the camera while you're watching a cutscene play out. I guess this was their way of avoiding a 40-minute cutscene again, but it is still a cutscene, so... It doesn't really do it for me. You drive out of the city and eventually your car is assaulted and crashes. Here along cutscene plays that introduces us to Higgs, who's named after the Higgs boson, a nerdy reference that I appreciated way too much. And this cutscene raises a lot of questions, but I think it achieves something very good, at least for a video game. It's intriguing. Who is this guy, Higgs? What is he doing? Why can he fly? How is he summoning these monsters? Why does the rain make this guy turn old instantly? Why did the guy start stabbing himself trying to kill himself the second that he started getting lift in the air? Why is he being lifted in the air? Why is it that when bodies begin to decompose, they start shaking violently? What the hell is this? All of these are fair questions, and I think they motivate the player to want to play more to have these questions answered. Again, the role of a prologue, I think, often is to pose a lot of these questions to the reader, player, or whoever's experiencing them. I don't think they have to all be answered, and I wouldn't even want them to all be answered in the opening sequence. However, with Death Stranding's specific circumstance, this doesn't do much to shake the preconceived notion, again, that this is all just crazy and done for the sake of being cool. Anyway, a bunch of weird stuff happens. This results in a massive crater and a handprint indentation in the land. This is actually why everybody throughout the game freaks out whenever you actually kill someone with a lethal weapon. Again, I know I've said this a thousand times, but more on this later. There's some cutscenes and exposition, but essentially you meet some more characters, such as Deadman, you get given drugs to deliver to the president, because she's dying, I guess, and needs heroin. And so you deliver them, you're in the Oval Office, but it's also a hospital at the same time. You talk with the president, who it said also raised you. It's implied it's your mother, but it's also left ambiguous enough that it could just be a woman who raised you. But regardless, you go through this sequence, a cutscene plays out as she explains how you need to help them save the world by connecting things, I guess. While this has happened, the president asks that everybody leave the room so that it's just Sam and the Madam President. And then she kind of freaks out. She tackles him falling out of the bed in one of the clunkiest and worst blocked scenes I've ever seen in any entertainment medium, like, ever. Seriously, even if you love Death Stranding's story, how can you defend this? Like, it's it's so bad. Just watch this clip. This is from my roasting video. Okay, clearly she's dying, but I swear to f if she dies during this cutscene, I'm gonna scream. I hate coincidences. I swear to mother. Bridget, you're the president of Jack shit. Sam, listen to me. Oh, gee, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Why is she on the floor crawling? <laughs> oh my god. 
Oh my god, she died. Oh, I. Mm. Okay, I gotta, I gotta calm down. I know, but it's like so stupid. I hate it when stories do this. When they're like, a character is dying. Go meet with them. You meet with them, and it just so happens during that like three and a half minute time period where you went and said hello, they die because it's convenient for the story. Like, why isn't it that you leave, say goodbye, and then she has a heart attack, and then die? I just come on. Oh well. Then again, Kojima syndrome. Check the comments, I'm sure you'll see many people defending it. So she dies, and after this you learn that you need to take her body to the incinerator to avoid what happened in the earlier scene. You load her up and you take her to the incinerator's location. It's actually a really peaceful sequence after you've strapped her up. There's a little ribbon blowing in the breeze, and you're walking across an expansive green pasture covered in rocks as a nice calming piece of music plays. It's actually pretty relaxing, but again, does it do anything to shake the preconceived notion that this is a walking simulator? No. Now, while you're delivering the president's body to the incinerator, you've also been asked to take a BB, or a baby in a jar, to this location to have it also decommissioned. You're not told a whole lot, except that this is malfunctioning and it's no longer in use. However, before Sam has a chance to do this, BT show up, and you use this BB to escape the area. Again, Kojima loves his acronyms. And I actually really like this sequence. This is the one moment where the player actually feels as though there's going to be more to the game than just a walking system. However, it's over before it even begins. Seriously, I was able to get out of here within about 30 seconds. In my humble opinion, it seems as though Kojima Productions should have spent a lot more time showing off what the BT system could do and how the gameplay could be extremely varied. But regardless, I think this BT sequence is really pretty, I think it serves a purpose, and I really like it, so thumbs up. You escape, make it back, and you learn that you need to quote unquote, expand the chiral network to fulfill Bridget's vision for America. You're also introduced to Amelie, which is a character that is painfully unlikable and has less charisma than a summer squash. I know that this is probably more personal, but I found her performances all extremely stiff. But again, I don't know if this is just her fault for performing poorly or if this is a writing issue and came from the direction of Kojima. Again, Kojima Syndrome. Now a quick sidebar. The characters are all asking Sam to cross the entire country, an extremely dangerous post-apocalyptic country, mind you, and save it. And while they're doing this, they're all stiffer than me during Rocky Horror Picture Show. What's pushing players at this point? What's pushing Sam? We've been told that we need to help connect America after a major event known as the Death Stranding. Okay, we know that Amelie is Sam's sister, even though they don't seem particularly infatuated or caring of each other, but okay. To me, it seems as though the operative question is whether or not this world, America in this case, is worth saving. Where's the humanity that is worth saving? And this is actually my biggest problem with Death Stranding, the game, writ large. It fails to give the player any clear evidence that the world is actually worth saving, that all of this trouble is worth it. Now I get it, there are not that many people now that the world has ended, basically, but still, there are very few moments that attempt to humanize these delivery recipients. I mean, hell, if you're gonna ask the player to go through the trouble of delivering packages mindlessly back and forth between locations, it seems like you should at the very least try to emotionally motivate them to do so. However, all of your interactions with all of the people that you interact with with these deliveries show up as holograms. You don't even get to see them in person. But again, was this a result of poor game design, lazy copy and pasted formatting of locations and interactions, or is it a meta discussion on the hopelessness that people have and how empty the world is without connections? Again, Kojima syndrome. The clearest example of Kojima seemingly attempting to humanize this world and failing miserably is when you're delivering things to the scrapper. You see, he has a woman that he loves and that he thinks is dead. You find out that she's alive, but her performance has got to be the worst I've ever seen in a triple A title. I'm not joking, I'm not trying to be funny, I'm not trying to be mean, this is just 
awful. And I, I get it, English is probably not her first language, but this performance is one of, if not the worst, I have ever seen. Truly horrible. Nothing personal. It's just that bad. Watch. Are you hurt? Thanks, Bridges. I can't believe you're alive. That's my line, silly. <laughs> I thought you were dead. My mom told me you were. <laughs> I kept it close, always. But after the attack, it stopped working. I thought about fixing it, getting the sand flowing again. But it felt too much like moving on, like forgetting you. Well, now we can both move on, together, you and me, if you're ready. Of course. <laughs> the man I knew. They took better junk. He fixed the things, made them like new again. Picking up the pieces and making the most of them. That's what I do best too. But this is one piece we don't need. <laughs> Now this could have been a moment to prove to the player that there's still loving, caring people in this world. Instead, we're left thinking that maybe we should put these people out of their misery because clearly they're poisoned with arsenic. Now I know I'm being harsh, but this happens repeatedly throughout the story, where there's a chance for the small characters to prove that this world is worth saving, but they universally fail. Again, the question seems to me, is this a writing issue on the part of Kojima? Is it his fault? Is it a directorial fault, again landing on the shoulders of Kojima? Or is it just that their performances are that bad? With this particular instance, I think you could say the performance is just that bad, but at the same time, Hideo is the one that would presumably have cast this woman in this role. So again, the fault still lands on his shoulders. Point is, I think that this is inexcusably bad. And whether Kojima was happy with this performance and this narrative structuring in the way that you interact with these smaller characters, the blame still lands on Kojima's shoulders. Now, thankfully, the main cast is phenomenal, and they try very hard to deal with the wordy and at times nonsensical script that Hideo threw at them. Sam, Cliff, Fragile, Mama, Deadman, Hartman, Die Hardman, Higgs, they're all fantastic. Pretty much with the exception of Amelie slash Bridget, I think the main cast is pretty solid. And it makes sense, they're the main cast for a reason, but when you're trying to motivate the player to save an entire country because they want to save the country, you have to give the player some reason to love and to care about said country and its inhabitants. And in my opinion, I know that some will disagree, Death Stranding fails miserably at humanizing the world that it's trying to convince you to save. Furthermore, this world is so void of life, it's kind of ridiculous. We see wildlife in the opening sequence of the game, as I mentioned earlier, so we know that it exists in this world, but we never experience it in the world. Like, ever. Or at least I didn't. You never see deer, you never see a lot of birds flying through the sky, you never interact with them in any way. There are also very few original assets in Death Stranding. A lot of things are repeated. From the repeated bunkers, to vehicles, to landscapes, to rock formations, to mule camps, everything is just copy and pasted around the map. Now we'll get into this in detail a lot more later. Don't worry, I've done a lot of math surrounding the placement of these items and it's really telling. But the point is, it begs the question, was this developed by a small team that simply didn't have the manpower to put more stuff into the game? Or was this a budgetary concern? Or was it some combination? Or was it part of Kojima's broader vision? Again, Kojima Syndrome. 
Regardless, Sam agrees to help expand the chiral network, begrudgedly at least, and the mid-game begins after a plethora of tutorial missions that introduce to you crafting, inventory, and loadout management, course charting, and much, much more. It's slow, but it's probably necessary, to be perfectly honest, before releasing the players into the mid-game. And let me be clear, there's nothing wrong with a long intro. Sure, it can be frustrating, especially during repeated playthroughs, but it isn't inherently bad. Look at Assassin's Creed 3, the game that has an intro that lasts roughly three hours before it even gives you control of a basic stripped-down assassin that it advertised pre-launch. It's not inherently bad, it's just inefficient. The only reason efficiency is important is to convince the aforementioned skeptical players to continue playing. Again, look at those two goals I put on screen. Does a long, dry intro achieve either of these? Probably not. But I didn't want to just take all of this on assumption. So in the survey that I conducted, again, all of the data is up on LukeStevens.net if you want to check it out yourself, I asked players who hadn't finished the game at the time of polling, and 28.5% of them said that they either weren't going to continue playing or that they were unsure if they would. That's over one in four players who didn't feel compelled to continue. And no matter how you look at that, no matter how you split it with a sample size of 2,400 people, that is a straight up failure of the game's pace and design. I don't care if you're making a video game, a song, a movie, or a book. If somebody gets just a couple hours into it, just dipping their toes into it, and over one in four people are unsure or straight up reject the idea of continuing, you have failed. Furthermore, the poll shows that over 36% of players who gave up on the game had put less than five hours in, and roughly 66% had played less than 10 hours before stopping. Sure, you can argue that this game simply wasn't meant for them, or they were never going to enjoy it, no matter how polished or how much they reworked the opening sequence, but I think the fact that so many players dropped out in the first few hours of playing the game shows that some Something was wrong with the first few hours. Again, these people are paying $60, presumably, to play this game. They put their money on the line, which by itself lends these opinions credibility, at least in my opinion. But this brings us to the mid-game, or episodes 5 through 10. This really is deliveries galore. You're slowly expanding the map, exploring it, delivering packages to your heart's content. This is where the game shines. This is where the gameplay reaches its highest potential. You unlock all sorts of new tools, vehicles, and things that you can do. Crafting and much, much more. This was the act of the game that I found myself enjoying the most, mostly because I was able to just look forward to making some deliveries and relaxing as I ran across the open countryside when I got back from a long day. I racked my brain a lot as to why this was so relaxing to me and why I enjoyed it, because on its face, it really is pretty simplistic. Sure, you might occasionally encounter some mules or BTs that require some stealth approaches to getting around them, but writ large, this this is just a game about delivering packages from one location to the other. It is extremely repetitive. So why did I enjoy it? It was a little baffling to me. But after a lot of thought, I think it's for the same reason that hiking is enjoyable. Because the game allows you to play it in just passive enough a state that you can let your mind wander. You'll find yourself daydreaming about other things as you explore this vast expanse and it's relaxing. Plus, it's no mystery that the world of Death Stranding is very beautiful, especially in a lot of individualized places that are heavily trafficked. Other less trafficked areas show a significant lack of polish in terms of the graphic fidelity, but we'll get to that later. But here I'm actually gonna say something that makes me sound like a fanboy, and that's that if you don't see the appeal of Death Stranding's gameplay system, I think you might need to try it. Now, I'm not saying that you should go out and pay $60 for the game or 40 if it's on sale just to try this and that if you don't do that your opinion isn't valid. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that the relaxing nature of Death Stranding's gameplay is something that you will only experience if you are the one doing it. In the same way that watching somebody hike isn't satisfying in the same way that hiking itself is. If you want to enjoy nature, you have to be the one in it. 
if you want to enjoy the world of Death Stranding, you have to be the one exploring it. This is why for a lot of people who say that they watch people play the game on Twitch and they don't understand the appeal of the gameplay system even though the streamer enjoyed it, it doesn't make much sense to me. Because having played it, it's pretty self-explanatory. If you want to enjoy the world, you have to be the one walking through it, building things in it, driving your motorcycle across it, you have to do it. But as to whether or not this is something that's going to appeal to everybody is a much larger and more difficult question to answer. And it seems to me that this is something that just isn't going to appeal to everybody. Which is why I said at the beginning, you should rely on your instincts. If the game has repelled you or has been simply uninteresting to you, it likely isn't going to change that opinion even after 10 hours. Anyway. Throughout the mid-game, you make a ton of deliveries. You go from location to location, unlocking new areas and meeting new people. I'm hesitant to use the word exploring, even though that's definitely the word that Kojima Productions wants you to use. For one, because in my mind, exploring is something that you initiate yourself. It's not something that you're pushed to do. Just because a quest can ask you to go from one location to a remote location, to me, that doesn't make you explore those locations. That's just having you traverse to that location. Exploring, to me, seems like something that you're going to do for the sake of itself. An example would be like in Breath of the Wild, when you find yourself just exploring the world, going through it without any quests, without anything specifically to do, just exploring it for the sake of interacting with and exploring it. It's adventure in its purest form. Death Stranding really doesn't encourage you to do this ever. There are very few secrets, very few things that you can interact with, and of course there are basically no NPCs or individuals that you can interact with within the world that make it worth exploring. But again, I know I've said this a billion times, we're going to talk about that more at length in just a few minutes. But once we plow through all of that, we get to the finale of the game, or in other words, Act 3, the ending that never ends. This is comprised of episodes 11 through 14, and it has big reveals, such as Amelie and Bridget being the same person. Uh, okay. You find out that Amelie slash Bridget are an extinction entity and that they can bring on the end of the world, which, again, is... Okay, and a lot of things are revealed in this sequence, which to be honest, I'm not entirely sure I could explain concisely, even if I spent a week writing it out. Chances are if you made it this far into the video, you probably already have a decent idea of what happens in these final hours, so I won't bore you with explaining all of it over again. The point is that Kojima actually explains a lot of the stuff that goes on during these sequences. Now, don't get me wrong, I think he could have done it in a tenth the time, but I'll take what I can get. There are a few things, however, I do want to touch on. For instance, the endless cutscenes at the very end of the game. The last three or four hours of the game are almost exclusively cutscenes or sequences within which there is very little player control or interaction. There's no big gameplay finale other than a large BT fight, I guess you could say qualifies as a boss fight. There's also the sequence with Higgs, a fist fight with him, which is clunkier than almost anything else in the game. It's really terrible. But I don't want to address all of that. I want to talk about the purgatory cutscenes that Amelie presents to you as you run around a beach. Basically, you're sent to your beach with the help of Fragile and everybody else, and you're just sitting here. And they play off some credits, and it's very peaceful, and it does feel like purgatory, because as you run from one end of the beach to the other, you will eventually just get spawned back further. It's basically the story of Sisyphus, and it's actually pretty cool. I really liked this when I first came to this area. However, after the first 10 minutes or so, it starts to get pretty horrible. Again, is this just a poorly designed way of forcing the player to sit through all of the credits rolling incredibly slowly? Or is this some sort of meta discussion of the purgatory that we all experience when talking about post-credit scenes in games and movies. I, I don't know. Point is, Kojima Syndrome. And every time you get transported back after a few minutes, Amelie will show up and present a cut sequence where she offers some exposition. Again, I'm glad that all of this is here and that it is exposited, and there are reasons that all of this stuff in this world take place. 
but I think it could have been done much more efficiently. Now, after all of this happens, you end up talking with Amelie at length, and there is what Vice referred to as the gameplay mechanic of the year. Thank you, Ryan, on Twitter for sending me this. I, I thought this was pretty funny. Basically, Amelie describes that she's going to end the world and that you can stop her or you can not and let it happen. Of course, most players are going to try to stop her, but I don't know. Let me know what you did below. Point is, you have a gun, and you can choose to shoot her, or you can run after her and hug her, which is what Vice referred to as the mechanic of the year. Now, she gives a bunch of forewarning, and she says that you should have known how this was going to play out, and you know what to do, because it's the entire point of your journey. And looking back on it, it makes sense. She's saying that it's all about connecting people, forgiving, and embracing others. So, going up to her and hugging her seems like the natural choice. However, this didn't work for me at all. Pull the rope or cut the noose. But whatever you do, don't hesitate. And I hesitated and I even tried to save because I decided immediately after she said I know what to do to shoot her six times and empty the gun in the back of her head, which doesn't actually do anything. At which point I ran up to her to try and punch her into submission to stop the world from ending, but that also didn't work and instead I was prompted with a hug button. At which point I pressed hug and I was made to feel as though I just made an incredible and generous decision when in reality it was kind of an accident. Now maybe I'm the weird one here, but this made the ending sequence really awkward because it feels as though I kind of broke it. It didn't expect me to shoot her in the back of the head, empty my rounds, and then go up to her trying to punch her, only to find out my only option was to hug her. It was completely unintentional that I saved the world, which made this all very funny. But after all of this, you are saved and the world doesn't explode and everything's okay, at which point you're eventually saved by all of the people that have helped you this far. Fragile, dead men, everybody. And this is actually what those people off in the distance on the beach are. We saw this in a trailer way back in the day a couple years ago and it seemed as though it was inexplicable. How would they ever explain these people just floating over the ocean? But they actually do explain it and it's kind of cool. And after this, Sam is saved. You're brought back to the world of the living. You go to a presidential inauguration for Die Hardman and you get some more exposition. But eventually you find out after giving the president a pep talk that you need to take BB to the incinerator because it passed away. Or I guess in Dead Man's words, it is no longer functioning. And I'll be honest, Kojima actually wrote this pretty well. The player had built a relationship with BB, having carried it with him for almost the entire game, save for the sequence where it's removed from you. And it's sad to be walking this deceased BB or dysfunctional BB, however you want to phrase it, off to an incinerator to have it burn. It's kind of a sorrowful event, but I will be honest, it's actually kind of cool to walk back through where you started. For those of you not aware, this is the exact same path that you walked with Bridget Strand when she died to take her to the incinerator. So effectively, the last mission of the game is mirroring Order 3, which is cool because that was basically the first order that you completed yourself. There are no mules, no BTs, no threats. You're just hiking along a large green mountainside and it's a nice way to finish. But once you arrive at the incinerator, a cutscene begins playing, which shows you a new perspective on the smaller cutscenes that you've seen throughout the entire game every time you had a load screen coming out of a private room, for instance. Now we get a new perspective and we see all of these sequences play out in order. And it's actually pretty heartbreaking. This is the place where Mads Mikkelsen actually earns his game award for best performance. He really nails it here. It's beautiful, it's sweet, it's sad, it's endearing, it's everything. It's incredibly emotional and I really enjoyed this. But after all of this ends and you learn that the BB was Sam and that Clifford was just trying to correct his mistakes from his past, everything comes back into the world of the living and you realize that Lou has been taken out of the pod and is now cradled in Sam's hands. He's frantically trying to revive her, doing everything that he possibly can to wake her up. However, nothing seems to work. 
and he eventually gives up, cradles her as he begins to cry. At this point, after a brief beat, you start to hear Lou crying. She's back. Sam is stunned and holds her in unparalleled jubilation as a bunch of BTs watch them from the background, which is actually pretty cool because it seems as though this is what has broken the cycle of all of these BBs having their souls effectively destroyed in the incinerator. Holding Lou, Sam walks out of the incinerator into the open air, and it's actually raining, although the time fall doesn't seem to be having any sort of effect. It's just normal rain. Furthermore, there is a full rainbow behind them, which is extremely bright. It also shows the color blue, which is something that none of the other rainbows in the game show. Now, what does all of this mean? Well, it seems as though the Death Stranding has officially come to a close and BB's revitalization has effectively restored the stability of humanity or something. However, I will be honest, this is so vague that there are probably a million different ways to interpret it, and it's not particularly important because everyone will have their own interpretation, which is kind of the point. What I will say is that it's a very calming, peaceful, and emotional end, even if I don't completely understand what's going on. Why was BB able to be restored, even though necrotization was starting to set in? BB was clearly dead. What brought her back? Why does the time fall all of a sudden end at this point? Why is Blue all of a sudden present in the rainbow just because a baby came back to life? I'm not entirely sure, but again, that's probably not the point. I would be interested, however, in hearing your theories as to what exactly happened when BB was saved here. I'm sure some of you have thought this through and have a reasonable explanation. I would love to hear it below. And then the actual credits roll. And after all of that happens, we are greeted with episode 15 prompted up to us and a quick reading that shows two weeks before. And this is what I meant earlier when I said that chapter 15 is basically indefinite. It goes on forever, even though it's just two weeks before the presidential inauguration. This is effectively Death Stranding's end game state. It goes on forever and it will allow the player to continue making deliveries, five-star locations, find and hunt down all of the memory chips, and complete any other things that they might have left undone. Now overall, the story, while it is kind of bizarre and crazy, it is thought through and it does have justifications and rules that govern it, which is what I said at the beginning I was looking for. However, there are a couple of missed opportunities I can't help to wonder why Kojima didn't explore more. It might have been that it just felt like it wasn't focused, or it might have been something that never occurred to him, I'm not entirely sure. Specifically, something such as the discussion that has to do with BBs and slavery. This is briefly touched on, but it's not really elaborated upon. Specifically, BBs come from mothers who died while pregnant, which is why those mothers are called still mothers. There are also other times that this concept is applied within the world of Death Stranding, such as with Mama, who we know was to give birth but was trapped in rubble after the Death Stranding, which resulted in the baby becoming caught between the world of the living and the beach, or the world of the dead. This is of course why BBs are able to detect BTs and can show them to the operator that has them strapped to their bellies. Now, while Kojima does have a lot of writing in here that discusses the inherent value of human life, even as a baby, he never really touches on the idea that you are literally taking an independent human as prisoner and you're going to dispose of them once they're no longer useful. As Dead Man says, it's a tool. It's because we're partners. Hmm. Partners? Sam, the baby's a tool, not a human being. Bridge, yes. Baby, no. 
And they don't really explore this very much. They do touch on the idea pretty aggressively that the BB is becoming sentient, that the BB is becoming human, and it's going to start growing like a regular human very soon. This is of course why Deadman has to take the BB away from the player roughly halfway through the game in order to perform an operation to separate it from the humanity that's pulling it out of the world of the dead and closer to the world of the living. And this is what partially makes me think that Kojima had thought of this and simply decided to focus on the more pro-life discussion having to do with the BBs, the idea that these infants still have value as human life, even though they're just infants. They're contained within a tank, they don't have much of anything by way of autonomy, but they still are valuable. So it could be that Kojima just decided that the discussion on slavery would have been too much and wasn't worth pursuing. Or maybe he just didn't think to add it in, I'm not entirely sure. Either way, it could have been cool to see him explore the idea of BBs being enslaved to a more powerful master and not having any way of fighting it or claiming their own independence. I'm not really sure, let me know your thoughts below. Another thing that struck me as weird throughout the course of the story is the fact that they break the fourth wall all the time, and I'm not entirely sure why. Now, of course, you could say that this is just Kojima's style, and that's what he likes to do, so to judge it is simply unfair. However, as I discussed earlier, the world that Death Stranding is taking place within has to be consistent, and it has to live by its own rules, preferably at all times. And for the most part, it succeeds in this. The game seems to want players to be immersed at all times with the realistic graphics and the traversal system being very realistic. But at the same time, Sam breaks the fourth wall constantly, though in fairness, it is mostly relegated to the private room. It feels weird. Ride with Norman Reedus AMC as an ad on the bathroom while he poops. It's really weird and out of place. I'm not really sure why it's here. Plus, if you leave the camera sitting on him too long, he'll gesture at you and he'll stare at you, make funny faces at you. It's fun, but it's weird. If I were directing the game, I would have cut all of this because in my opinion, it's not worth the trouble. It pulls the player out of the game and while you are in a private room when these things happen, I don't think that that's an excuse. Though I will admit that this is probably a matter of personal preference. Some people will mind it, such as myself, others don't mind it at all, and some, I'm sure, really enjoy it. Now, of course, these fourth wall breaks and these think outside the box mechanics are nothing new to Kojima. As somebody sent me on Twitter, Metal Gear Solid has a sequence like this when Snake is fighting Mantis. You actually have to change the port that the controller is connected into in order to complete the game and continue on, which is kind of funny. Imagine doing that today. It's weird because Kojima talks about being an artistic purist and describes how he thinks Americans don't have artistic sensibilities, but he's the one putting paid product placement in his games with the Monster Energy drinks and the AMC ads. Can you imagine what people would say if Todd Howard started putting Tesla ads in Fallout or Elder Scrolls? People would rightly lose their minds. The only reason Kojima gets a break is again, Kojima Syndrome. Now, don't get me wrong, fourth wall breaks can be done well, even in narrative-focused games. Look at the Lost Legacy tower sequence, for instance. Here, there's a tower you can find, and there's a very narrow route that you can climb up, optionally, and if you get to the top of it and you hang out there for an extended period of time, Chloe will start to tease you and will actually break the fourth wall. However, things like the otter hat that you get from Conan O'Brien within Death Stranding are somehow both weird and perfectly in place. It's really bizarre, but you can't help but feel as though Kojima didn't take all of this very seriously, which I also do appreciate. I mean, they're video games. And all customization is like this, from changing paints to glasses to otter hoods. It's all fun, and though it doesn't mean much in the story, it's a welcome addition, even if it doesn't make sense in terms of bridges having standardized uniforms that everybody is expected to wear. But the point is, while the fourth wall breaks may bug me, I can understand why they might not bother other people. I think it is a matter of personal preference. It just bothers me, though it might not bother you. But with all of that, let's discuss the gameplay and the systems that make Death Stranding work. So obviously a lot of people have said that Death Stranding's gameplay loop is quote unquote boring. To determine if this is true, let's look at what your average mission is going to be comprised of. Let's start with story missions. 
In this case, we're going to look at a random order in the mid game. Now in this order, we have 60 minutes to collect medical devices from one character in the mountainous area and then deliver them back to the area where we accepted the order. In other words, a fetch quest. Now this is actually one of the more elaborate order types that you can get because it involves multiple stops. Simpler orders just give you items with a destination. So you accept the order and get told that you need to deliver the items quickly, and furthermore that the items that you're picking up are classified as fragile, which means that you can't drop the packages, often you can't go in water, etc. Basically, you have to be extra careful. You select your gear and load Sam up with any ladders, PCCs, climbing anchors, extra boots, or weapons that you may need. Then you set out and you begin hiking. In this case, I'm not going to use any vehicles because we're going through a mountainous area and they aren't particularly useful in this rocky, snowy area. This is what would usually be considered a more difficult mission, specifically because it's in the snowy mountainous area. Not once in my over 100 hours with Death Stranding did I encounter a mission where I failed the time limit. The only time I had any difficulty was when the items were fragile, or when I was completing multiple orders all at once, loading up with four or five orders at a given time. And so, the way that the game dynamically alters the difficulty is with the routes that they'll have you do. This is why long routes tend to reward you with more likes, and routes that go into the mountains also do the same. Now you can unlock certain items that make snow traversal and mountain traversal easier. For instance, lots of ladders, climbing anchors that you can level up, power gloves, the all-terrain exoskeleton, and of course the zip lines, which you can use to set up routes after you've initially explored them. So with all of this in mind, I continued hiking. Eventually I reached a cliff top where I could have just dropped a ladder or a climbing anchor to descend and then cross by foot, but I happen to know that this area is infested with BTs, so I decided to build a zip line which allowed me to completely skip this area, which effectively skips 5 to 10 minutes of navigation. Don't worry, we're going to go into a lot of detail with these zip lines in just a bit. I reach the bottom and continue hiking. Eventually I pick up the items, and then the entire process repeats as you return. Now when you drop off the items, you are graded on the condition that the packages are in. This can be both the quality of the outside container, in addition to the quality of the internal item, which can experience damage if you aren't careful. For instance, if you fall off of a ladder, you'll fall, take damage, and the packages will be worth less when they're eventually delivered. There are, however, ways to deal with this. For instance, with the Timefall shelters, if you stay in them, and especially once they're upgraded, they'll actually repair your items as you stand underneath them. There are, of course, also the cargo repair sprays, which you can carry on your back. But this is basically it. There isn't much more to the gameplay system other than this. I know it may come as a surprise, but Death Stranding is not a third-person shooter. It's also not a monster-fighting focused game, which means that all of the combat encounters that you'll experience are pretty clunky. And I don't know about you, but every time I went to one of these flashback sequences with Cliff, I was really excited because they're very visually impressive. You get to travel back to World War I or World War II or Vietnam. It's very interesting visually, but once you actually engage with the gameplay, you realize that it's just a shooting gallery and it's not a particularly difficult one, even on the hardest possible difficulty. It doesn't change much. Really, as long as you're keeping cover and shooting the enemies when they appear, which is all the time, you're going to be fine. Now, as you would expect with the story, the game heavily encourages you to make sure that you're never using actually lethal means of taking down opponents, that you're only using non-lethal means. For this reason, they include non-lethal assault rifles which basically completely negates the difficulty that would have been put in place by having a non-lethal requirement. Basically, these are still guns, they just don't finish the opponent in a death state. Instead, they're in an incapacitated state, which allows you to just continue on your merry way. I don't know why they did this, because it seems to undermine their own pursuit of making sure that the player needs to take a step above everybody else. The player needs to have non-lethal means of interacting with enemies, such as the mules, because they're better than the mules but instead you just use assault rifles that incapacitate them, 
which completely eliminates any gameplay difficulty that would have been there as a result of taking a stealth approach or a peaceful approach. But rest assured, this idea of the game undoing itself is something we're going to talk about much more in just a moment. But while discussing these deliveries, it's also important to discuss the map design. Now in my mind, this is probably the most important game design element that is here. The mechanics of walking, balancing, and using vehicles can all be fantastically well designed, but if the world itself is not worthy of being explored, nobody's gonna care. Now, like I said before, there are very few inherent reasons to explore the world of Death Stranding. There are no major secrets, no NPCs, and only a very few select secret locations and items to find that make the player excited and wanting to explore more. For instance, in Red Dead Redemption 2, there are all sorts of dynamic encounters that you can either choose to interact with or not, but the world is littered with them, which means that every time you go out to explore the world, you're going to find something new and interesting. It's one of the reasons the world of Red Dead Redemption 2 feels so alive. My favorite example in RDR2 would of course be the incestuous siblings, where I was just riding through the map and I encountered this brother and sister who were very close. They try to kill you and a bunch of really funny and interesting stuff goes down. I won't spoil it, but I highly recommend hunting them down if you're ever in that world. Or another example would be the puzzles and encampments that are hidden all over Breath of the Wild. They make the world worth exploring for its own sake. Now there are things in Death Stranding to find, I can already hear you saying it. Things such as the memory chips and the hot springs, but I don't think these actually qualify and I'll explain why in just a moment. The main thing to understand is that the world of Death Stranding isn't particularly well crafted, at least in my opinion, and I have a lot of math to back this up. In fact, it seems to me that this map was dynamically generated with very little input on the part of the development staff, and they just went with it once they found a random arrangement that they liked. Once they had this, they decided to scatter all of the flat areas with boulders and streams, and I have to ask why. Seriously, you will be hard pressed to find any stretch of grass that's more than 100 yards. These rocks, after all, take a positive action to create. Somebody has to put them there. So clearly there must be some reason as to why that individual was instructed to put them there. And to me, it seems pretty clear. They're just there to break up the monotony and to make traversing a conscious activity. And they also are there to make vehicles far more difficult to use. This is because if vehicles become too useful, the deliveries cease being an engaging experience where you're engaging with the world, looking around and interacting with it, and slowly begin to be a matter of tedium. After all, if all you need to do to make a delivery is hop in a car and drive from one location to the other, why do you need to build and upgrade the roads? Why do you need to build zip lines? There would be no reason to, which is why you have to drop boulders on the ground to make cars and motorcycles just annoying enough to use that it would be more useful to spend the time upgrading roads and zip lines. Now, for those of you who have followed this channel for a while or have seen some of my older videos, you will know that I do a series where I break down the density of a game world. Basically, I will take a selection of gameplay that's two or three hours long, and I will chart out how much time is in between moments of interest. How I define moments of interest is something that changes my thought process. So if I'm exploring the world and I see an animal run across the screen in Red Dead Redemption 2, something that catches my attention and changes my thought process, that qualifies. But something such as just avoiding a tree while riding a horse wouldn't qualify because that's something I can do passively. Now granted, this is an incredibly subjective way of measuring these types of things, which is why it's something that I do myself. I don't use data from other people or other people's gameplay. This is only from me, so it would seem in my estimation that that alone would serve as a fairly good control. 
Now all of this started back with The Witcher 3. The designer said that they were aiming for anywhere between 30 and 40 seconds between moments of interest. If they hit that number, then they would know that the world was dense enough to hold players' attention while feeling expansive. And in my testing, The Witcher 3 does in fact adhere to that rule. And I've tested a lot of games in this way. Zelda Breath of the Wild, Skyrim, Fallout New Vegas, all of them. I even calculated this for Red Dead Redemption 2, which had the longest time between moments of interaction, but the quality of those interactions were much higher. For this reason, I decided to make the same calculations for Death Stranding, because it seems to me that this world doesn't feel anywhere near as alive or interesting as the world of Red Dead Redemption 2, Zelda Breath of the Wild, or even Fallout New Vegas. So I broke the map into three broad areas where a lot of orders are going to be taking place. Snowy areas, greenery laced late game areas, and stream heavy areas where vehicles are usually going to be used, but their batteries may drain quickly. For these, I used roughly two hours of gameplay footage, timed out the moments in between moments of interest, and then I paused the timer whenever I was interacting or dealing with something that engaged my interest. So for instance, if I encountered a mule that started attacking me, I would pause the timer while I dealt with that threat. And once I began exploring again with a clear mind, I started the timer. And this is the data I collected. Now, do you notice anything? It looks completely randomized. There are a couple of exceptions here and there, such as when I was navigating a very dense area and it required a lot more of my attention, but broadly, this is incredibly random. In fact, looking at the standard deviations and the kurtosis of the charts, it seems to me it is randomized. This is something I haven't seen in any of the aforementioned open world games. All of those had very intentionally placed items and dynamic interactions. They were placed and designed in such a way that they would intrigue the player and they would be paced out in such a way that the player would always have something tickling their fancy. However, the world of Death Stranding is completely randomized. Everything here looks as though it was dynamically placed with almost no effort put on it from the developers. There's no careful crafting of routes. There's no trail building to give players a clear way of going. There's nothing like that in this world. It literally looks as though it was just randomly generated and left alone. Again, I can't express how insane this is for a $60 title in 2019. In my opinion, it's straight up unacceptable. Now I can't help but also feel as though the world of Death Stranding is made in a much more realistic way. In other words, it is random. It isn't carefully crafted by developers to enhance the experience of the player. But the point is, we're playing video games here. This isn't the real world, and if you're going to try to improve the experience for the player, you are going to need to enact some positive actions. But even with this data staring them in the face, I guarantee you there will be people who will defend this. They will say that this more realistic way of designing the world was intentional, and it's good because the world itself is more realistic and exploring it and navigating it is more realistic, which is the point of Death Stranding, bloody blue to blah blah. Again, Kojima syndrome. This is straight up unacceptable in a triple A game in 2019 when this released. It's not good. This is laziness personified. And frankly, this explains why the world does feel so empty. The design wasn't carefully crafted or arranged. Sure, mules and BT zones are permanently placed and those don't change, but rocks, ledges, routes, and everything else in the world that you explore seem straight up randomly placed. I also did some further calculations on the placement of the items that you can find throughout the world, such as other zip lines that players have crafted, generators, and the like. And believe it or not, these are also 
pretty much random. There are a couple of constraints that seem to be put in place, such as a limitation on how many of a single item can be in a given area. So for instance, you can only have one online generator within a certain radius of another generator. But in general, this is all randomly spawned in with the limitation of chiral volume and those distance limitations that I just mentioned. This is laziness, and I don't know how anybody could defend it. Again, the question is, is this just a team that was too small or was incapable technologically of dealing with this, couldn't craft it more carefully, or maybe they just decided it wasn't worth crafting it more carefully? Who can say? Whatever the excuse, in practice, the design of the world is random, and it's lazy. Now, speaking of chiral bandwidth, I have to ask, why? Why is this a thing? Chiral bandwidth is the system by which the game determines how many of a certain item or a collection of items you can craft. Wanna build a zipline network that's massive and expansive and spans the whole map? Too bad, because you have chiral bandwidth to adhere to. This is basically their version of a carry weight limit for items you need to craft, even though there also is a physical carry weight limit. But you get what I'm saying. It's stupid. It's just a way of controlling density and increasing tedium. If you want to build a bunch of zip lines, you have to go delete other zip lines in order to build new ones. The question is whether this was a technical limitation, something where they couldn't handle more of a certain item in the world, or if it was a design choice. Again, Kojima Syndrome. There were many times when I was building a massive zipline network and I was limited because of this bandwidth. Now, sure, as you upgrade certain areas and you five-star new locations, you will increase the bandwidth that you're playing with, but it's never unlimited and you never have the ability to build to your heart's content. There is always this arbitrary limitation and it is very frustrating. Now, it seems to me that this was probably put in place to make you reliant on other players. In other words, if you can't build an unlimited number of zip lines, then you're going to have to rely on online generated zip lines as well. And other things in the game do this as well. They make you reliant on other players and their work. Examples being exoskeletons having batteries, motorcycles and trucks all needing batteries as well. In order to charge these up, you need generators, and dynamically in the world, there are many online generators placed in highly trafficked areas. This is something that makes you feel as though you need other people in order to continue exploring. Even though you could have just charged it up yourself with a generator you built, it makes you feel as though you're all working together, which is a cool mechanic to have, and it does work in making you feel as though you're all working together. But there is a side effect to this mechanism, and that's specifically that these batteries just feel tedious. Especially when you consider how small the charge on these batteries actually are, even in the long-range version of the vehicles. Building generators for these just feels like busy work. It's not actually fun. Let me share with you the exact moment I was completely fed up with batteries and that system within this game. I was driving this truck with a huge amount of cargo loaded in the back. I dropped by one location, I loaded it up, fully charged it, and then head out onto the planes. And this is a futuristic truck with a fully charged battery. But this thing has an operating distance that is so low it would make a first generation Tesla blush. Seriously, this is where I started. And as I drive and drive and drive and drive, not even going very far, this is where the battery dies. In the middle of the stream. The car immediately starts freaking out. It pushes me out and then instantly the car disappears and all of my cargo floats downstream. And this was so much cargo, I couldn't possibly load it up onto my back and it all drifted out into the water and was ruined. This was well over a thousand likes instantly lost and several deliveries instantly failed due to a stupid mechanism just designed to make you engage in this tedious gameplay cycle of building generators to charge batteries to get to another generator to charge your battery so you can move on. In no way is this realistic. And that's the other question. 
If this world is designed to be realistic and that's your excuse as to why the world design is so crappy, then why are batteries and things like this so clearly gamified in order to make you engage in the gameplay system? It's not consistent. If you're going to make the gameplay systems realistic and lifelike, do it. Don't do this half-assed thing, otherwise it just ends up being frustrating and forcing the player to wonder whether or not you had any idea what you were doing. Now another feature of the world are the memory chips. There are 56 of these and they're hidden in very random places with almost no visual cues. Now the first time you hear about these is when you receive an email in chapter 3 from a character named Nick Easton. In it, he describes a quote unquote weird glowing thing that he wants you to find in Capital Not City's isolation ward. And these emails are actually the only thing that push you towards finding these chips. It's not really a concern in the main story. Now I ran around for hours and hours collecting these, even the one in Higgs' secret room that doesn't unlock until after Fragile deals with him on the beach. And the question is whether or not these are busy work just designed to pad out a platinum run or if these are placed in the world as a reason for you to explore it and to hike through trying to find every single one of them. Now to me, it seems pretty clearly that it's the former, not the latter. And to prove this, I'm gonna show you some examples. These are some of the more commonly collected ones. So if you've yet to find all of them, don't worry, you can still hunt them down and have a good time for what it's worth. When you go to the weather station, there's one placed on a concrete ledge. Okay, you run past this frequently enough. I think I'm fine with this one. This one, however, is along the red wall. It's not an area you would ever be running by. There's no reason for you to explore this area. And even once you get there, it hides very, very well. It's hidden in the truck bed of this area you have no reason to go to. This one I'm less okay with, and it doesn't seem as though it's hidden in a way that encourages you to explore the map. It's hidden in a way that encourages this busy work type of gameplay. This is another one that I'm actually okay with. It's hidden in an underpass by Mama's base. This is something that I did stumble onto while exploring. I didn't have to read any email cueing me to this area. So obviously I'm okay with this one. This is one I'm not okay with. It's on the hood of a semi. Sure, it's outside of an area you're going to be trafficking fairly frequently, but you can't normally climb onto vehicles. You have no reason to ever climb onto a vehicle. So the only reason you would hop up on this is if you scanned it, happened to spot it, and jumped up to grab it. There's no reason for the player to be looking up here or looking for memory chips in this area. This is something that you would just stumble onto or would find if you were cued onto it. There's this one in the back corner of the loading zone room. It's just sitting on the floor. Now, fair enough, if you go back here, you're going to spot it, so it's fairly easy to find. However, the player has no reason to ever go back into one of these areas. It's just placed here, and you're expected to figure that out for reasons, even though there's never anything else placed in these back corners in any of the other loading zones. There's this one in the snowfield, just sitting on top of a collapsed pillar. This is one that you would probably find during normal gameplay, especially because this is a BT heavy area, and this is a zone where you're going to be crouching and stealthing your way through. So I'm actually okay with this one. This one makes sense. This one's in a cave, and this cave is actually marked with a ton of signs as a timefall shelter, so it's also likely that you would probably encounter this one through regular gameplay, even though I didn't. But the one I like by far far the most is the one hidden in Higgs's secret room. This is in the top right corner of the central zone of the map, and it's basically Higgs's center of operations. It's a really cool hidden area that I like a lot. This is really cool that they included this here, even if some of the quotes scribbled on the wall are kind of funny and weird. I'll just say it again, I really like this, and I really wish there were more things like this hidden and scattered throughout the map. If the map were littered with things such as this, the player would have a reason and an excuse to explore for the sake of exploring, without any delivery strapped to their back, just going through the world for the sake of interacting with it. But alas, as far as I'm aware, this is the only thing like it in the game. Now it's pretty clear to me that these are supposed to be hunted down with the emails that you receive in the game, which is obviously true because 
because many of these chips won't actually spawn until you've received a given email describing them. So clearly they want you to be interacting with the emails and using the emails to find them. For example, the memory chip, the walk, doesn't actually unlock until you've leveled up the first prepper, one of the most isolated individuals in the entire game. And because you're supposed to rely on these emails, I think it's fair to say that these are here to encourage you to read through the emails, not here to encourage you to explore the world. The last thing that I can think of that would encourage you to explore the world for the sake of exploring it would be the hot springs. These are something that are briefly mentioned and they're kind of cool. Basically there's six by my count in the middle zone alone and they allow you to hop in and there's regenerative qualities to them. And though it is cute because you hop in and you chill with your BB, I never really felt the need to use these or hunt them down intentionally. When I encountered one, I would hop in, but that was really the only time I ever used them. Again, I'm glad they're here, but this is by no means a reason to explore the map. It's just six things that sit on the map that are kind of fun when you find them, but you'll forget about them within 50 feet. The point of all of this is to say that the world design of Death Stranding is so incomprehensibly bad, I don't really know how to explain it other than pure laziness. Hell, my degree is in corporate finance. I'm not a specialist in game design, but all of this is pretty basic to me. And the fact that Kojima Productions can't manage to follow any of the basic practices of AAA open world game development, it's completely baffling to me. If you have an explanation for it, I would love to hear it down in the comment section below. Regardless, one of the other common accusations that's levied against Death Stranding is the idea that the gameplay is purely repetitive and there's no reason to engage with it because of its repetitious nature. And on the macro level, I think that is fair enough, which is why I ran through the basic outline of a quest earlier in this section. However, on the micro level is where I would slightly disagree, because while you are going to be repeating the same basic macro process of delivering items from one location to the other, you are going to be using a plethora of different tools in order to achieve this end. Whether you're walking, using motorcycles or trucks, ladders, climbing anchors, bridges, or zip lines, pretty much across the board, you're going to be using a plethora of different tools. All told, it is repetitive in the purest sense of the word, but what game isn't? In Red Dead Redemption, you're going to be engaging in gunfire fights and riding your horse. That's pretty much it. In The Witcher 3, you're going to be talking with people and sword fighting. Sure, occasionally you're also going to be crafting things, but that's also true of Death Stranding and even with Red Dead Redemption 2. Every game has a set of gameplay mechanics that they're going to repeat rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat over and over and over again. After all, it's kind of the definition of a video game. To me, the problem isn't with the fact that the gameplay system is repetitious. The problem is that the orders, while being repetitious, require you to go over areas that you've traversed time and time and time again. It ceases to be interesting after the first few times, especially once you've built items that help you get over this, such as ladders, climbing anchors, bridges, or zip lines. They completely negate the need to engage with the other elements of the gameplay loop and end up just turning this whole process into a tedious one instead of one of exploration and adventure. This is especially an issue because you are encouraged to craft a ton of items and to load up way more than you likely need for a given mission. I found myself many, many times trying to use all of my ladders and climbing anchors that I had brought with me just because I had crafted too many and I didn't want to have a back fully loaded of things that I wasn't using. So I would make sure that I would drop all the ladders, all the climbing anchors and everything that I had carried to make sure that they were getting used. If anything I ever built was interfering with the chiral density or was making it so that the chiral bandwidth was overloaded, I would just delete them. And many times the game actually does this for you, which is why the time fall is kind of a cool gameplay mechanic, because it's a reason in game for items to deteriorate and get deleted effectively after a certain amount of time, which forces you to go back over those areas, rebuild the things that you had previously put there. But I don't think time fall degrades these items fast enough for you to feel as though you need to constantly be upkeeping on all of the things that you've put into the world. Furthermore, I was almost never limited by resources when I was crafting these things. After all, resources tend to be stored in the locations at which you're crafting items, so there's rarely ever a time where you find yourself 
short. Only when building roads and bridges did I notice a need for extra materials. But after a few quick trips to a mule camp and back to the home base to extract materials, all of this was fixed. I experimented with some higher difficulty options to see if this would make item spawns or material spawns much lower to make this much more involved, to make it so you couldn't craft four ladders, two anchors, two boots, two gloves, five guns, and three vehicles all at the same time without ever feeling the impact of it. And I'm sorry to report, the difficulty really only affects the combat and the damage that you receive and deal out. It doesn't actually change much of anything, as far as I can tell, in terms of item spawns or anything like that. Furthermore, you can also repair items and packaging. If a road is degrading or if a bridge is breaking down, you can just repair it with some extra items. Though, I will be honest, I never felt the need to do this in all my time with the game because the crafting cost of a brand new one was so low. But now we get to the point where Death Stranding starts to kind of undo itself and unravel. And this is my biggest late game problem with Death Stranding in addition to the poor world design and also the lack of any sort of emotional tie to the world you're trying to save. You see, the gameplay system is fairly sparse to begin with, which isn't inherently bad. After all, anyone can boil anything down to its simplest parts. You can say that Disco Elysium is just a walking simulator, or that Grand Theft Auto V is just a crime simulator. In my eyes, you can turn anything into a game as long as that thing is fun and fulfilling. Hell, you can even make a farming game fun and relaxing. So, my problem isn't with simplistic gameplay systems. It's with systems that undermine themselves on a fundamental level. And I know that this is a big accusation to levy against Death Stranding, and I don't make it lightly. So allow me to argue my point. The zipline and the leveling system. You see, the zipline, in my opinion, is far too useful. It makes all other traversal techniques and mechanics completely obsolete. You see, once you set up a few zipline routes, you have no need to ever craft ladders, to ever craft climbing anchors, all-terrain exoskeletons, it's all useless because once you craft a couple of zip lines at the highest peak and build your network out from there, you no longer have the need to interact with the lazily designed world. All you do is dangle by your cufflink as you fly through the sky. It bypasses all BT interactions, all mule interactions, effectively negating the entire gameplay system that they just set up. And I think Kojima Productions was actually aware of this and became aware of it at least later in development, which is why they added the chiral bandwidth system in in the first place, because they realized if they allowed players to just build zip lines everywhere, it would completely negate the need for crafting roads, building ladders, bridges, everything. Now, the obvious defense of these zip lines, as they are, is that they're going to force players to appreciate the work of other players, that you're going to use online zip lines in addition to the zip lines you're crafting. Paired with the chiral bandwidth system, this makes sure that you're dependent on other people. But I would argue that this isn't the case, because roads, which are introduced very early in the game, require so many materials to construct, they do this job. Zip lines are simply too cheap and easy to construct in order to make you feel truly dependent on other players. In fact, because the placement of these online zip lines seems so randomized, as I discussed earlier, I found myself deleting online zip lines multiple times because they were getting in the way of my own zip line network. If Kojima really wanted zip lines to represent the ultimate cooperation between players, they should have been far more expensive to build instead of just a level two PCC. In my opinion, the fix to this would be to make roads far more important in the late game and to have zip lines completely cut or made far more expensive on the same level of expense as roads. These things are so cool fast and they bypass so much of the gameplay system just like the roads do that they shouldn't be so carelessly added. This is coming from somebody who has a huge network of zip lines set up in his save file of the game. I love the zip lines and I think they're far too useful. Now, I don't know when they added zip lines to the game, but it seems to me they were probably added later in development when they realized that the late game map was going to be too vertical for roads. This is likely one of the reasons why roads are discussed constantly in the first 10 to 15 hours of the game, and then it seems like everybody forgets about them and they start talking about zip lines. 
mountains. My guess is that this was because they realized roads and mountains don't mix very well, whereas zip lines could be the ultimate fix-all for navigating over mountaintops. But to me, this is no excuse. All they had to do was make zip lines more expensive in terms of materials and to make it so perhaps they require three players, chiral IDs or something to construct. Point is, there are ways they could have done this to make sure that zip lines weren't too useful so that players would continue engaging with the core gameplay loop that they had spent 30 to 35 hours engaging with previous. Now I get it, you're giving players more options, more tools to use in order to engage with the game. I get that. But if players are given the chance to spam the gameplay loop, they will, for better and worse. And in this case, I think it's for worse. And again, it really seems that Kojima Productions were all aware of these systems becoming too useful. They were scared that roads were too useful, which is why they made them incredibly expensive to construct. They were scared that vehicles were going to be too useful, which is why they scattered almost every square inch of the map with rocks and boulders and rivers to make sure that they were just tedious enough to use that you wouldn't get reliant on them. This is also why batteries are attached to every useful item in the game, whether they're speed exoskeletons, power exoskeletons, or the all-terrain ones all because they want you reliant on other players and to make sure that you aren't bypassing all of the other gameplay systems. After all, they could have made a truck or a snowmobile that made the mountain sections far easier, but they didn't because those were supposed to be the difficult sections, which is why it's so strange to me that the zip lines completely negate all of the mountain sections and make them ridiculously easy. Now, in addition to these zip lines, the leveling system, I think, also undermines the gameplay progression, though I will be honest, in a much lesser degree. You see, every time you level up, you can carry more. You keep your balance better. It increases your stamina, your health, everything. This is pretty common, but it often means that the game becomes easier to play the later you get into it. This is actually one of the major criticisms I made of Assassin's Creed Odyssey that I made in my ultimate critique of that game, which by the way is just under three hours. If you're enjoying this video, I recommend that you check that one out after this as well. The point is that as the player becomes more powerful, they become less reliant on the gear and the items that you have been given. Again, undermining those very items. Now I wanna shift gears a little bit and talk about the broader implication of Death Stranding as Kojima described it. He said that Death Stranding was going to become and was going to introduce a new type or genre of game. In my opinion, he didn't do this. Effectively, the idea was that the world was going to be shared, at least in terms of the items that players will put in the world to share. Now, don't get me wrong, the chiral network and shared items are cool, but it doesn't actually feel like a revolution, at least I think, in the way that Kojima intended. Sure, it's helpful to have a zip line already built in an area, but the developers limited the number of items that can be placed in a particular zone so that it never feels particularly crowded. And in concept, this is pretty simple and straightforward. It's a world that's shared, but you can't actually see or find other players. You only see traces of them, which makes you dependent on them. And the game actually tries to turn this into some sort of profound statement, but I think it's just an attempt at explaining why other players are absent. I don't know, you let me know in the comments. The paths we walk become roads, Sam. See the tracks you left behind? They tell a story. If you were a spy on a mission, you'd have failed. But you're not. So be proud of those tracks. They're proof that you exist. Keep leaving that proof. Let people know you're out there. Give them the courage to come together again. As you expand the network and aid your fellow Americans, you strengthen the bonds between us all and blaze a trail for them to follow. And honestly, having this in mind, why not have other players visible and present? You could give them other skins so that they don't look like Sam to avoid griefing and even have their movements recorded and then played back in your world at a later time to prevent griefing ad nauseum. This would be similar to what racing games do when you race against your friends, even when they're offline. You just play against a ghost of theirs. This could make it so as you explore the world, you're actually seeing other porters delivering stuff. And yeah, sure, now there are NPCs that you occasionally will see walking with weapons and things, but these are non-player controlled 
controlled characters. These are computer controlled, they are not other players. And while yes, you can occasionally see a ghost of a player or signs that other players have left, this is not anywhere near on the level of having truly interactable players, at least in my opinion. The point is they could have fully realized multiplayer systems in Death Stranding and it wouldn't have disrupted the story or the gameplay. So why didn't they? Well, it could have been technical. It could have been monetarily determined. It could have been that they didn't want to advertise it as an online game. It could have been that they were avoiding the PlayStation Plus requirement for online play, and that would have gone over the line. Or it could have been simply that Kojima wanted the world to be empty. Obviously, he stripped it of other life, like the birds and the deer that we see in the opening. So maybe he meant all of this to be empty and lifeless. Again, Kojima syndrome. I think it could have really added to the game even just to have AI controlled NPCs wandering the wastes and delivering packages constantly. You pass them on trails, you can speak with them, you can trade with them. They might have a ladder and you have a climbing anchor, you need the ladder more so you trade for it. It could have made the world feel much more alive. Again, worth saving. And this is my primary point of this section. If this new genre of game is supposed to bring people together, it's ironic that it's done the exact opposite. But all of this thoroughly convinces me that this game was on a strict budget and even was rushed out the door. Allow me to argue my point. To me, it seems pretty clear. Animals were cut from the game. They went through the trouble of modeling and animating them for the opening sequence they must have been in the game at some point and they were completely cut later in development when it became clear that they were going to be too tedious to place carefully in the world or perhaps they were making the world feel too alive and it didn't feel like an apocalypse. Either way, it looks as though they were cut. NPC interactions after orders are almost all holographic and look objectively terrible. These are all copy and pasted with different skins effectively and new voice actors but they're all the same. Bridges and fragile housings, buildings, and environments are all copy and pasted across the entire game. Very few vehicles, especially considering the variability of locations, snowy areas, rocky areas, river covered areas, they're all highly variable. And the vehicles that are there to offer transportation across these are nowhere near as variable. There are areas on the outskirts of the map in the central area which are all glitchy and frankly terrible. It shows that they put a lot of effort in polishing the central areas and the heavily trafficked areas, which is fair enough, but it shows that there's a real lack of polish all over this game, you just have to know where to look. And all of this is too bad because it does really make you wonder what Death Stranding would have looked like if Kojima were given another year or so to work on it and a lot more money. But that brings us to the question of Kojima's strengths and weaknesses, which no doubt there are plenty. I figured what better way to end this critique of Death Stranding than to discuss the man himself. You see, Kojima does whatever he wants, whenever he wants to. That's kind of the whole point of him leaving Konami, is that now he is completely free. However, after playing through Death Stranding, I can't help but feel as though he desperately needs a dramaturge or a co-director to keep him in check. I feel as though through the course of this video I've outlined a lot of reasons why Kojima needs to be restrained and needs to have have somebody to deal with him in a much more mature way. Because I honestly don't think he knows when to stop or when he's being ridiculous. I could point to things such as the fourth wall breaks, all of the product placement for AMC and Monster Energy drinks. There's a lot of really bad plot twists and a lot of the writing in here is so wordy it's hard to even follow what Kojima is trying to communicate. Now I took a playwriting class a couple of years ago and it was really interesting but one of the things that the teacher said on the first day of class was that new writers tend to write a lot, whereas experienced writers tend to write well. And I couldn't help but feel as though Kojima is a new writer. He seems to just throw all of the spaghetti at the wall just hoping something sticks. So instead of writing a monologue that's three sentences long, he'll write one that's 15 minutes long and hope that you get something more significant from that. I think it shows a certain amount of insecurity in his writing that he feels as though he can't communicate in as short a time as a lot of other writers could, such as Neil Druckmann, who wrote The Last of Us Uncharted 4 and is currently writing and directing The Last of Us Part 2. Now listen, I loved PT, and that was all Kojima. 
but it was a humble and confident Kojima. It wasn't Kojima with something to prove having left Konami. And to be honest, I like humble Kojima more than this new one. Now in that survey I mentioned at the top of this video, where over 2400 of you responded, I asked you guys what you thought of Hideo Kojima, and many of you had some pretty varied opinions of him. Here's a selection of some of the ones I thought were interesting and funny. He's an artistic genius who can't tell a coherent story. I think he's innovative and incredibly talented, but he fails to see criticism for what it is, and his fans think he can do no wrong. Wrong. He needed others to rein in his vision to make it more appealing. He knows exactly what he wants to make and he doesn't waver. He's an innovator, but not a hands down genius. He presents the most unique ideas for world building and characters despite falling on rather generic writing tropes. He's an excellent designer with ideas he doesn't know how to clearly express. The very definition of an auteur. He's a great visionary and original storyteller, but a weak writer. And then 57 of you guys said he's kind of insane. Now all of this seems to coalesce into a consensus that he is a talented artist with a lot of really interesting original ideas, but that he doesn't know when to stop and to delegate. For instance, he has an original story idea, but he insists on writing out the macro and the micro story elements himself, despite being objectively bad at writing dialogue. And it's really too bad, because if Death Stranding were more lean, it could have appealed to a lot more people and it could have made a much bigger splash. So, in closing, Death Stranding is an enigma. It's a game that I'm glad that I played, but one that's plagued with issues through and through. And while I'm glad that Kojima got to pursue his passion project, I do hope that his next attempt is far more coherent, more polished, and much more fun. But that's all from me. Thank you so much for watching. If you've made it all the way to this point, you are a scholar and a saint. Special thank you again to the patrons that funded the production of this video. Again, it would not have happened without the generosity of these individuals. And a very special thank you to Zachary Johnson, Mike Holland, Christopher Scott, and Paige Richardson for their generosity. Let me know all of your thoughts on Death Stranding below, and if you'd like to vote on and help fund the next critique, make sure you go and check out my Patreon page. In addition to getting all sorts of behind the scenes peeks at the development of these critiques, helping pick the thumbnails and much, much more, you also get access to exclusive monthly Q and A's, free merchandise, early access to these critiques before anybody else, and exclusive videos just for patrons. But thank you all for watching. I love you all more than you could possibly know, and I'll see you in the next video.